Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, y'all. Pittsburgh. I bet you're a little cold this morning. It is, oh, I forgot to end my, it's 34 this morning. That's freezing in Mississippi, literally. That's like the coldest it gets, just about it. Washington State. Yeah, that's super cold. Eighteen degrees? No. I think my body is just not built. You're built different. You are built different. 31. Florida is 72. Oh, yeah. I think that's not even our high today. Arkansas is 34. Yep. Oh, 32 in Kokomo, Mississippi, 20s in Texas. 20s in Texas? That's insane. Snow yesterday. You hate the cold. You live in the wrong place if you hate cold weather. <laughs> My sister lives in Nashville, so it's a little bit more chilly up there by a few degrees. You're in Florida and it's 42. You must be on the, the northern side of Florida. 24. Whew, y'all. It's so crazy to me. New York is not even as cold as Virginia. Isn't that crazy how weather is? Weather is nuts. It's a beautiful day to save souls. It sure is. It's a beautiful day to talk about some Jesus. I'm not ready for winter either. I am, but I'm not. I am ready. Doesn't the time change this Sunday? I am ready for that. I am ready for the time to change because I'm so sick of it being dark outside in the mornings. Like, it's just it's like pitch black. Twenty-seven. Hey, for those of you who wanted, um, who go back and watch the YouTube videos or subscribe um, to YouTube, uh, I uploaded five videos at about 10 o'clock last night. So, um, all the first John ones, some of the first John ones, and I'm all the way to chapter five in first John. And there's some that won't be uploaded because they are, they were like not approved for download by the app so um anyway like it'll it'll like there's some that just won't be uploaded um but the ones that I could I've, I've almost gotten called up so that I can be I can upload our Peter ones faster and then y'all can go back um and if you miss one you'll you'll have access to it more quickly um is your time change an hour back or forward it's back right we get an extra hour of sleep. So it's darker at night. Um, yeah. It gets dark faster at night, but it's lighter in the morning. I love it. I love when the time changes. I'm such a like, I'm such a morning person. When the time changes, I'm like, yes, I don't have to drive to work in the dark. You know, I love it. I wish I would pick one and leave it. True. I kind of like the time change, to be honest. I like, um, like in the winter months, I like that it gets cozy faster at night. I don't know. Maybe I'm just weird. Um, maybe I'm just the only one. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I can get you at 10. So, Yvonne, do y'all not, y'all don't, um, do y'all not change times? Like, is that just a... United States thing I don't that may be an ignorant question but I just don't know I am ignorant to that actually good morning I 
Yeah, it probably is because I'm a morning person. Yvonne, do y'all not change time so y'all's time will stay the same? That's wonderful for you. I'm so happy for that. I hope it doesn't mess anybody else up. I think the only people that would be, I'm not even going to say because I'm not a history person. Um, yeah, true. My little boy was up till like 11 o'clock last night. And so that's why my YouTube videos got uploaded. <laughs> um, anyway. Oh, a few states don't even change. Wow. Okay. I didn't know that. And you do have daylight savings. Okay. I want to go to Canada so bad. Just a side note. Um, my YouTube is a holy hustle. A holy hustle. Okay. Let's pray and we're going to get started. Um, because yesterday it's 48 Faith on here. I'm not sure if she's on. I just saw her name pop up. Um, and she yesterday posted a video or was it? Hey, there you are. Okay. Yesterday, um, I was watching your live and, um, I, anyway, I was like, you said something that really like hit me because it's something that I struggle so much with. And it's like, you can spend so much in God in time and God's word that you don't actually like, you're still not productive in the mornings for, for Jesus, as far as like your family and stuff goes. And I was like, Oh, convicted, the convicted, the conviction hit. So anyway, I'm going to, um, I'm going to, I'm going to be better. I have prayed this morning that I can be better. Take your words and run with them. Um, because it's so easy to like do all the right things as far as like spending time in the word and then doing good things and still not honor like showing up for my family like I should like still rushing my kid um you know to get ready and stuff like that which sets his morning up for chaos and that's not what we're called to do as moms and so um we do the best that we can and not every morning is going to be perfect but I do want to be better about that so I say that every time I get on here um Yes, where he leads us in the moment. You're so right. So let's pray and then we will get started. We're in First Peter chapter 3 and we're going through verses 13 through 17. So let's pray. Dear God, I come to you today and I am just beyond thankful for the opportunity to be able to read your word. God, there's so many people that don't either have access or, you know, are not able to because of limitations in education and all these different things, God, we take so much for granted. And I pray this morning that you would allow us to um, just soak up the blessing it is just to be able to pick this up and read it and get a word from you. Um, God, I pray that you would honor this time, that you would allow us to um, respect you with it and serve you in it. And God, I pray that you would hide me behind the cross and show up in spite of me, in spite of my limitations and my limited knowledge. God, I pray that every word that is spoken is of you and for you and for our good. God, thank you for all that you do. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Let's get started. Yes, it was a live and it was so good, but I do think I've I've watched a video of hers. Um anyway, so we are in first Peter chapter three verses thirteen through seventeen. All right. So first Peter chapter three, thirteen through seventeen. And you know, yesterday we talked about suffering for righteousness sake and how when someone gives us evil or not to repay them with evil. So when someone goes against us, we're not to repay them with the same um, action or attitude. We are to approach them with the attitude of being a redeemed person that belongs to Christ. Because the way that we treat people is a way that we show them the love, grace, and mercy that's been poured out over us. So when we respond, we respond out of somebody who doesn't belong to this world and doesn't bank on this world to be their et eternal home. So we respond in a way that we want to point others to Christ and to the surrender that we have through him. So 
Um, that's where we were yesterday. So we're continuing on with that. This is the same like section under the same heading, which is not, wasn't original. This was a letter. Remember that. So when you're reading, don't think that like Peter stopped and like labeled this. <laughs> this is a letter. So he's writing to these people who are under suffering, um, through Nero, who was over the Roman Empire at that time. And so they fell under his reign and were experiencing suffering, which is important for what we're reading today. So verse 13 says, now who is there to harm you if you're zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil." And I was listening to a sermon, um, like a quick little snippet, a breakdown, um, Desiring God, which is John Piper. He will do, I love listening to him because his, his videos are very short. They're very to the point, which, you know, y'all know that Mark is my favorite gospel. I like that. I'm too ADHD for the fluff. So those of you who stay on here with me, y'all are just hanging on by a thread because I am, I am not the person that's to the point. That's what I like. So <laughs> y'all are listening to me, even though I probably wouldn't even listen to myself, which is funny. Um, so I liked how when he read this, he actually stopped and prayed and said, God, help us to understand how we should put others to shame by the hope that we share because putting people to shame is not the end goal for a Christian in regards to our relationship with other people. And he like stopped in that and he prayed that. And I was like, how awesome is that? Like to be, to like stop and recognize that like y'all and I'm not, you know, like I'm not glorifying him. I'm just saying like to recognize that like shame is not our goal for those who do evil against us. We always approach every situation in regards to leading people to Christ. So showing them God and showing them how we belong to God so that they would repent and turn to God is always the goal. So when you read this, don't read this in a way that says like our good behavior is going to put them to shame. Like our good behavior is going to, we're going to repay them. Like God, God's going to get even. Like we don't read this in a way we're putting them to shame, like in a way that's like a get back at them type thing. Like, oh, we're, you know, I want you to be put to shame because of how you treated me. Like you're, you, you deserve that. You deserve to be put to shame. You deserve, you know, to feel that shame the the shame that is put on them is should all should be in a spirit of conviction so that they want what we have and how we respond does that make sense so the way that we the way that we approach these things and the reason why we want them to feel that shame is because they are they are um acting against truth right? So they are acting against the truth that is actually their redemption. And so we want them to feel shame in that so that they turn and respond to the calling that Jesus places on their life to turn to him and surrender to him. So this shame isn't like a puffing up, like a prideful, we want you to feel shame so that you, you, you feel bad for what you did to us. You know, like you should feel terrible for that. We belong to Christ and you shouldn't treat us like that. It's not that kind of haughty attitude. It's a shame that's like they will be put to shame so that in that they will feel the conviction to turn to Christ. That's important. That's so important. And I never would have realized that, you know, and so a healthy shame. Yes. Yeah, like the shame that convicts people to turn. Um, so just throwing that out there because that was good. Um, Anyway, but verse 13 um, says, and I love that, like, 
side note, I love that that is how we should go through scripture. We should go through scripture prayerfully when we read something that's like, hmm, that doesn't make sense or that's a little weird. We stop and we pray like, God, reveal to us your purpose behind this. And that's why it's a living word. Like, yes, commentaries are good. Yes, I have one in my hand literally right now. But God, God will reveal stuff to you as he is the one who inspired scripture, like he still goes with you. His Holy Spirit is with you. So he will give you words and a mind of Christ to be able to understand what you're reading and to take nuggets of truth out of it. So don't, don't neglect that. We have so many resources. Don't neglect the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Um, Okay, verse 13 says, Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? Um, zealous, I looked that up because I know like zealous is like this fire, like this, I'm ready, let's go. You know, like the, I've said it before, like the charge hail with a water pistol type attitude. Like we are ready, we are going, we are, we are on fire, we are going and we are doing the thing. God is worthy of our service, we're doing it, you know. But zealous um, in the Greek word was actually um, an imitator, just so that, you know, it's an imitator or a devoted a devoted adherent. So you are devoted to adhering to the truth. You're devoted to doing what is good. You are, no matter what circumstance it's in, you are devoted to honoring God and and living in surrender to the Messiah who died for you, right? So living in that same pattern of surrender, like we, we belong to God, we surrender our life to him, whatever that brings, we are going to do good, and God's going to bring good out of it for his glory. So that's what zealous means. Like you are, you are going, you are ready, you are, you are going to do it, you are going to imitate the gospel, no matter what the cost, you are devoted to it, you are going. Um, the NIV uses the word eager. So you're ready, like you're ready to do that, you're eager to do that. Um, the New King James Version actually says become followers. Um, become followers. So you follow what is good, um, which is Christ. You know, um, you, you're follow, you become followers of the good. Um, we can't do that outside of, yeah, I was about to, the Holman Christian Standard Bible was my next one. And it says we are deeply committed deeply committed to doing good. So you are doing it no matter what the cost. That's what that means. You don't quit when things get hard. Um, and something that came to my mind when I was reading this is what good is our faith if we only demonstrate it in times of great prosperity? So what are we showing people if the only time that we are devoted, we are zealous, we are ready to do the thing, um, thank you for that. We're ready to do the thing is when we're prospering. What is that going to show the world, right? That shows people that our God is a genie. And so as long as he is answering in the way that we want him to answer, then we're good. But if he doesn't respond in a way that brings us good or that doesn't allow us to have to go through trials, then, oh, well, then we don't respond like that. We're not devoted to it. So when you're devoted to doing good, you're going to do it regardless of what situation you're in. Okay. Um, I just loved that. I loved that there was so many breakdowns for that word. Um, and zealous to me, like when I think of zealous, I do think of like the, the book Radical, which I actually haven't started reading yet. Um, it I literally got it this past week. So it, it's on my TBR list. But um, that book talks about a lot of different scenarios where people just lived out their faith radically. And zealous reminds me of that. So anytime I think of zealous, I think of like a radical devotion to your faith, like I'm doing it no matter what happens to me because that's how strongly I believe in it. Um, verse 14 says, But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. So even if you suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. So you suffer 
and God's going to show up for you. Your suffering means that God is is present with you. Like you going through something and remaining steadfast to your God is going to produce the blessings of God on your life. So God's going to be with you. And my mind always goes back to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We're not promised to be delivered from the suffering. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the Hebrew boys, didn't bow down. And, you know, the ruler said, if you don't bow down, I'm going to throw you into the fiery furnace. And so they didn't because they were honoring God. Um, and so that's an example of how submitting to authority is not a thing when it goes against your faith. So they didn't bow down and the ruler took them and threw them into the furnace and there were three of them, but four appeared. And so God was with them in the fire. Um, and, and he delivered them from it. They came out. They didn't even smell like smoke. They were completely unaffected by the fire, even though they heated it up to be even more times hotter than it was originally because the ruler just got so mad at them for how they didn't respond in his uh, command to worship this idol or whatever. And so um, through that, the God delivered them and so their blessing was deliverance and then and then like deliverance in the trial and out of the trial and that's not always the case and so uh, sometimes our blessing don't think that just because you're going through suffering or you know you're going through something difficult God is always going to deliver you earthside from that it doesn't mean that there's so many people that have died radically for their faith, that have died as martyrs for their faith, that have been, that, I mean, even like, was it Peter that was crucified upside down? Almost every, I think every single one of the um, disciples were actually martyred for their faith. Is that right? Like, can somebody, I'm pretty sure that almost, that every single disciple was actually martyred for their faith. So that blessing doesn't mean that you're going to receive deliverance except for John. Okay. And that you're going to receive deliverance this side of heaven. It just means that you're going to be blessed regardless of what you go through. And then your, your, um, your blessing is actually eternity with Christ. That is enough. Like that, that is enough. That is enough. No matter what else you receive, no matter what else God allows to prosper. Um, it is, it is your eternal reward. That is the blessing, right? Um, so, I, know, I mean, I know like almost all of them were martyred for their faith, which should actually inspire us to remain even more steadfast because they walked with Jesus. They're eyewitnesses to him and they were willing to even go to death for what for what they experienced with him. And so all the more we should because of that, like that is just an example for us that they really believed. It's even more of truth that it was real because if they would have walked with him and he wouldn't have been real, then why would they have been willing to die for that, right? So, and that's historical evidence that they actually were martyred. It's not, it's not even like, that's not, their their deaths a lot that were not even captured in scripture we know a lot of that because of history and all of that sort of stuff and so um our response to that is like yeah yeah that's another that's another that's another nail that that Jesus was actually real because they were willing to do that and they experienced life with him they walked with him they were an eyewitness to that so Anyway, not that you need any more proof, but I mean, you know, historically, that is just cool. When you go back to historical records and you're like, okay, yeah, like even history aligns with the Bible. How can you say it's not real? You know, like you, you have to experience that for yourself. Um, who I could get off on that, but I'm not going to. Okay. Um, have no fear of them, nor be troubled. Verse 14 says, and the NIV says, do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. And it says, but if you suffer for righteousness sake at the beginning of that, but these Christians were already suffering. So it says, if you suffer for righteousness sake, but they were already in suffering. So this wasn't like a if then statement that we're, that we would think of. It's not like if you suffer keep going because they were already in that. So when they were reading this, it likely would have been in the scope of death. Like if you suffer as far as like, if you're put to death, like if you suffer in, in really gruesome ways for the cause of Christ, like even more so than the persecution you're facing on a daily basis. Um, 
do not fear their threats and do not be frightened, the NIV says. Like, they can't touch you. Not not ultimately. They may can harm your body, this physical outer shell of who you are that holds the spirit within you. But they can't harm you because this is just like a housing place for the spirit that resides in you that has an eternal home. And you're going to receive a new body. You're going to receive an, a whole new a whole new body one day to carry that spirit into heaven. And so this little, this outer shell that the world can harm, yeah, it might be painful. Yeah, it's going to hurt. Yeah, it's going to be, it's not going to be easy. But through Christ, it's worth it because of the eternal reward on the other side. And so um, he's like, don't fear their threats. Like they can't touch you ultimately. Like you belong to Christ, right? So he says, but even if, um, and they were already suffering, but they belong to Christ. And I wrote down um, this and I actually highlighted it because it was like, it was something that like literally knocked me out of any nowhere. But it said, but I said like this thought came to mind. They have no ultimate power over you. Suffer like this life is not the end of your story. Oh, so flipping good. Suffer like this life is not the end of your story. Suffer like this life is not the end of your story. Remain steadfast like this isn't the end for you. This is not the end of your story. You are an eternal being with an eternal home with Jesus forever. We suffer in light of that. In light of when when we go through things on earth, it doesn't shake us to our core because people can do things against us and then we're like, okay, shake it off. Like, that you don't you don't define me you don't define me i don't belong to you i belong to a holy god and so i'm going to go through things in light of the perspective that this is not my home that i belong to christ so whatever happens in this temporary place is just to bring honor to him because of his deliverance of my soul that's why i show up here that's why i do the things here it's not to be comfortable it's not to be prosperous it's not to be a millionaire it's not to do all of these things because this is not my home. I'm not putting weight in things that will be burned up in the end. I'm not, that doesn't mean like don't try to make a living for your family or like doing things to make a living or whatever is a bad thing. It just means that like don't put too much weight in that because it's literally going to burn up. This is not an eternal place. All of this is flawed by sin and it's not welcome in our eternal home. So we live in light of that. We live we live in light of the glory that we will receive on the other side of this, right? On the other side of death is really where life begins. On the other side of death for a Christian is really where life begins. True life, living with Jesus, how they originally intended it in the Garden of Eden, which is to worship and praise Him for all of eternity. That's where we are looking for. That's where our hope is. Um, and that like literally leads us right into verses 15 through 16. And it says, um, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always bring prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. How do you respond when things happen? How do you respond when people um, do bad things to you or when things come against you or if one day you're you're called to martyr, be martyred for your faith? How do you respond to circumstances like that? With the hope that is in you. Because it's going to point other people for Jesus. And it says to be be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason. So when you look different, expect people to act, ask you why you act different. So why you respond in that way? Why? How can you posture your heart in that way? When, when people are mean to you, how do you respond like that? When evil comes against you, how do you respond like that? So you need to be prayed up. And studied up so that you can you can respond to them about the gospel of Christ. Like you need to understand your faith. You need to have a a knowledge of what you actually believe. Not because a preacher told you when you were born all the way up until you were 30 years old. Not because you've been churched all your life. Not because you live in a, a very available Christian environment where there's a church literally on every single corner of every single street, not because of that, 
but because you have sought the Lord yourself. And so you understand what your faith is. Like you have a knowledge of what your faith is. If your faith is literally based on the teachings of when you were growing up and you have not sought that for yourself, you're missing out. You're missing out on the blessing and the glory of experiencing Jesus in a personal relationship. You're not really experiencing him for yourself. You're banking on what a preacher said all while you were growing up or what or what somebody else is telling you even even like if you're not spending time with the lord outside of this 45 minutes to an hour a day with me you're missing it friend like you're missing what god wants to tell you he wants to speak to you not just not just through me um this is great it's a bible study and it's a way to inspire us and get us stirred up for the gospel and get us like ready to do these things but like if you're just showing up here i'm gonna say this and i'm gonna say this boldly if you only have an hour in the morning, if you only have an hour in the morning, I want everybody to come close and listen to me. If you only have an hour in the morning, do not spend it with me. Get off this live and spend it with Jesus. That's what I want you to do. If 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 my live takes the place of time that the only time during the day that you can study the scripture for yourself, it is more beneficial to you to go sit with the Lord yourself. Have that relationship with him. Let him speak into you because that is what God's going to do. He's going to... He's going to speak into your life and be personal with you. And so I just want... I just want y'all to understand and know that like that's that's what I want. That's what I want you to do. Like I would, I don't ever want this to be a platform where I'm like you know, like I was thinking about this last night. Like I'm here for an audience of one and you should be too. Like whether this platform goes away yesterday and 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 disappears and doesn't exist anymore. I'm here for an audience of one. I serve an audience of one. The everything that is in our life and about our life is for our God, right? So it's as bold as I can get <laughs> with it. Um so be prepared to make a defense is about knowing what you believe. It's about experiencing your faith for yourself. It's about experiencing God for yourself. Um Spend time studying yourself. Your faith has to be real to actually produce hope. Your faith in God has to grow to actually produce that hope that's going to respond to suffering the way that it should. Your faith in God is what is going to be the difference in you responding out of fear and you responding in love. Um, the way that we don't we, we are the only to have fear of God. Only to have fear of God. The rest of the stuff, whatever happens, whatever happens, happens. God's already got a plan for it. He's already got it. He's already got me sealed in heaven. I'm just going to live out my faith as radically as I can for him. Right? Yes, head knowledge isn't going to produce hope during trial. You are so right. Um, it has to be a devotion to Christ. It has to be. I'm sold out to you. It's that, what did we talk about? It's that zealous devotion to what is good that we talked about in verse 13. Um, man, we're moving this morning. Okay. Um, six Verse 16 says, having a good conscience, conscience. Oh, wait, let me back up. It says, with gentleness and respect. We don't approach people out of a haughty, I'm better than you attitude. That is not how we share the gospel with people. We don't approach people in a way that like, I'm on this level and you're on this level because the floor, the ground is equal at the cross. You are no better than anybody else. The only difference between you and somebody who hasn't been redeemed is that they have not surrendered their life to Christ and you have. And in that, you should be more willing to serve them in love to show them Christ. And so you should humble yourself down to not think more highly of yourself than you ought which is what the scripture says like it's not this it's not this oh I'm a Christian you know like you walk in the room and you're like <clears throat> okay God sent me here I'm ready whatever you throw at me people I'm ready because I am here on the authority of Jesus so you can't tell me nothing that is not how we walk in the room pride is the enemy pride is of the enemy you walk into the room with a humble spirit 
knowing God sent you there to be a servant to those people, to serve those people in love because that's what Jesus did. Jesus washed feet. Jesus served food. Jesus did all of those things that probably would have been looked down on by a ruler. Like rulers didn't wash feet. Feet were nasty. They wore sandals or were barefoot. I mean, they didn't have Nike Dunks. They were walking around on dirt roads in 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 like cobblestone areas. Their feet were nasty, and Jesus, they weren't even. They had to like put them behind them at the dinner table. So when they sat at dinner tables, like on the ground, you know, when they sat, they would have to put their feet like behind them because they didn't even want them around their food. They were so nasty. And Jesus bowed down to wash their feet. Um, If you go to a feet service, a feet washing service, which is very rare these days, but if you go to a communion that has a feet washing service, 90% of people, they're going to have a pedicure. They're going to have scrubbed their feet. They're going to be ready. You know, like they're going to be ready. They've washed their feet because they don't want you to smell them. That's not how Jesus washed feet. Jesus didn't wash somebody's feet who was already prepared for him to do that. He served them in love and did that when they were nasty, when it was gross. And why did he do that? To demonstrate humility to them and to serve them in love because he loved them and he was going to show up for them, right? So that's the God that we serve. So when we walk into rooms, we walk in with the attitude of how can I serve these people in love and humility? That's the approach we take as a Christian. We take it with gentleness and respect, right? Gentleness and respect. We approach things out of a gentle spirit and a respectful spirit. Now, how can you respect somebody who doesn't believe what you believe? You can do that by knowing that your words aren't going to be what saves them anyway. It's got to be the work of God. So, you just show up in a respectful manner. You be truthful. You be honest. You be you you respond in love. God's got to do the rest. The outcome is not on you. It's not your responsibility to convert them. It's your responsibility to show up in the way that God's called you to do. And then he's got to do the work in their heart that's going to call them to them. And they're going to be the ones that have to surrender. So you just do your part and let God do his. That's how we do that in respect. And in that, when somebody does something to you that is rude or whatever, or they say, like, I don't believe what you believe, like, you're you're ridiculous, you're stupid, whatever they want to say, you walk away. Like, you walk away because you've done your part, and you walk away not mad about what they said, but you walk away and you know that, like, the truth of the Spirit convicts people, so they're not going to respond initially in a heart that's like, oh, yeah, you're right. I'm a horrible person and I need a savior. That is not how we responded when God revealed himself to us initially. And that's not how we can expect them to respond. The truth of the word convicts people, which stirs up all these feelings of like, no, it's it's breaking down their pride. It's breaking down all of their arrogance. It's breaking down all of these things that we want to think that we're better and we're more self-righteous and we're all of these things. What what the truth does is tell us like you're nothing outside of the word of Christ. And so God's going to have to do that and reveal that to them. And then they're going to have to surrender in response to that and say like, you're right, God. You're right. I'm nothing without you. And that work is not on you. You couldn't do it if you tried. So release that. And say, like, it's just my job to show up, right? It's just my job to show up faithful and what God's called me to do. Whew, man, this was good this morning. Um, Okay, verse 16 says, Having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. And what do we say at the beginning of this? Put to shame as in, like, they are shameful of the way that they treated you because of the conviction that comes over them. That's what the reading the whole scripture, there is nothing where God is like, I want people to be put to shame so that they do not experience me at all. Now, people who continue to reject God, yes. Yes, like he's, yes, they, they're they rejecting Jesus. They're rejecting and saying, you are not my savior. You are not my person. I'm not surrendering to you. They will continue to be put to shame. But the shame that they feel is meant to call them to salvation. That's conviction. That's meant to lead them to repentance, to break down those, those prideful, haughty aspects of who they are, to break that down so that they realize that they're nothing outside of the love of Christ and the redemption that we get through Jesus, our Messiah. And so that is what that is. It's it's a rem, it's a way that we break down that that attitude of self righteousness, so that we realize that our righteousness is found in Christ alone through our surrender to Him. 
Um, which again tells us don't walk into rooms being like, I, I want you to be shameful because of how you treat me. That is not the attitude that we should have as Christians. We should be broken hearted when people don't repent for, for God. And not because of the way that they treated us, just because we want to see their salvation. Like we should love people so much that we're broken hearted, not because of what we had to go through, but because they reject God and are not going to experience him for eternity. That's where our heartbreak comes from. Um, and that is a high level of God. That is what we strive for. I'm not saying we're going to be perfect. Trust me, I get my feelings hurt a lot of times. Um, y'all can ask my husband. But but it doesn't stick as long anymore. Does that make sense? Like the closer I get to Christ, the less peop- the, the less it sticks when people hurt me. So like I may initially get my feelings hurt or I may initially be like, Mm, you know, like that's not, and I'm, I may be like over an overthinker for a moment and like replay all of these things and like go through my head with it. But then you, but then the closer you get to Christ, the easier it is to release it and be like, you know what? I, they don't define me. I don't belong to them. I'm serving God. So my response is going to be that no matter what happens, my, my service is to God alone. Right. Um, God's word is what matters, not the translations. Uh, let's see. I was thinking somebody said something, but I guess y'all are talking about like Bible translations. And then it says, for it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. This is going to be a statement that a lot of people, um, that the feel-good prosperity gospel does not believe in. And that's that sometimes... Christians will suffer and it's in the will of God. Our suffering is in the will of God. How do I know that? Because nothing that happens to a Christian is outside the will of God. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love us. It doesn't mean that we're not loved or cherished or that he's a that he's not a good God or that anything like that. Because remember, our circumstances do not define God's character. God is good because of who he is, not because of what our circumstance is. And so his character is good. So everything that he intends for us is good for for our good and for his glory alone. Everything that we do in this life is to bring glory and honor to God. And everything we do in the next life, guess what? Bring honor and glory to God. All those country songs about I'm going to be fishing and have a 10 acre, whatever dirt road, blah, blah, blah in heaven. That ain't it. It, the reason we're going to heaven is to praise him for all of eternity. The reason that we're going to heaven is not to have an eternal vacation, even though It's going to be an eternal vacation, but it's not, it's not for us. It's for us to serve the God that pulled us out of the depths of our sin and the wrath that we deserved for all of eternity. That's why we go to heaven It's to praise, worship, and honor God. And that continues from this life into the next. We just get to do it as a pure spirit, (laughs) not hindered by sin in the next, which is going to be beautiful. Um, so within right now, yes. So we, that's what we do. It's not for us to be, it's not for us to, it's not, it's not an eternal vacation home. It's not for us to, you know, like, don't think that you're going to get to heaven and it's going to be about you because it's not, it's all about God. It's all about God and his glory. And if that upsets you, you need to understand that you don't deserve any of it. Like it's not for you. It's, (laughs) it's for God and his redemption over you is a gift because you didn't deserve it. It's for honoring, glorifying, and praising him for all of eternity. And he fully and rightfully deserves it, right? I read that explaining heaven to us is like explaining the internet to the ant. That's probably very accurate. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, all right. For it is better to suffer for doing good if that should be what's God's will than for doing evil. And that's how we're going to end. Like all of our suffering is for the good of God. And it's better to do that than to YOLO this life and think that this is all that there is. Because it is not all that there is. This is not all that there is. You have an eternal home waiting for you on the other side 
of this life when you surrender to God. And that is the goal. <laughs> yep. That's not, we're not YOLO in this life. That's not what this is about. Um, we're, we are living in response to a God that called us out of our sin and redeemed our soul. Look at me, 546. That was a God thing in itself. So, Uganda, hello. Okay, you guys, um, I'm hopping off. We're going to pray and then I'm going to hop off because I'm going to upload my, I'm going to spend a few minutes in Patreon uploading my notes and doing our challenge question and all that for my people over there. And um, then we will meet again tomorrow morning. <laughs> we will meet again tomorrow morning and um i'm i'm working on getting everything uploaded to youtube so hopefully i'll only be like a day or two behind um moving forward so uh i'm working on that working on it diligently so okay let's pray and then we will go do the thing um it is friday tomorrow dear god I come to you today, God, and I just thank you and praise you for all that you do, all that you've done, all of the good things that you pour out on us when we don't deserve it, God. And and the fact that we really haven't had to suffer much for our faith, the fact that we really get to experience you in a free way. Um, and so I pray and ask that, God, you wouldn't let us... Um, be haughty or arrogant because of that, that you wouldn't allow us to, um, that spirit of arrogance or I'm, I'm better than you attitude to overcome us, God, because everything that we do is in response to being called out of our sin and it's in response to glorifying you because you are such a good God and you deserve it. And I pray today that you would allow us to continue to keep that high perspective over you that no matter what comes against us, we can endure because of the power that you've put inside of us through your Holy Spirit. And and our our responsibility is not on their response. Our responsibility is on serving humbly and being willing to wash feet being willing to wash feet and get down and do the thing that nobody else wants to do to show other people Christ. And I pray that in every response to every situation today that we can do that. All 300 plus people can do that, that we can respond in a way that brings you glory. Not for our own self, but for you alone. So that when people ask us, we can respond and tell them about the hope that we have in you because of Jesus Thank you for Jesus, God. I pray that you would be with us today, no matter what we're going through. God, that you you already know. You already have a plan and a purpose, and you, you can already um, make a way because you already have. We love you, and we thank you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. I love y'all, and I am praying for y'all. I hate getting off of these things. I want to hang out forever, but I can't do that. I'm honoring God with my time. So y'all honor God with yours too. And I love y'all and I hope that y'all have the absolute best day.